The plan today is to walk through the report recommendations. Uh, as I think you appreciate, I handed the report to government on Friday. I'm no longer the commissioner. The governor has asked me to outline the report recommendations. They are considering these recommendations now. So I'll just walk through what I think are the essential parts of uh, the recommendation. And then I'll answer some questions. Right. You'll be aware that um, the Commission was asked to look at um, the elements of the nuclear fuel cycle. Mining and milling, further processing, so taking the ore, converting that into a fuel source, using the fuel source to generate electricity, and finally storing uh, and managing waste. So the raw recommendations were that the state has uh, considerable ben benefit for mining, um, that the administrative and regulatory framework was satisfactory to managing an expansion of mining, and that there are good geological reasons to believe that there are further mining resources, uranium mining resources, in the state. And the recommendations talk about how to utilise uh, those opportunities in terms of bringing together the information uh, and also continuing to explore uh, for uranium into the future. Whilst it's an important opportunity, we didn't think it was a, a significant opportunity for the state. Taking that and converting the uranium into a fuel source was uh, considered as a second term of reference. And the issue there for us is that following Fukushima, there is a reduction in uh, the number of nuclear reactors and an oversupply in terms of enrichment conversion and fuel fabrication, about 20% uh, in terms of national, uh, international market. On that basis, the, the Commission did not consider that it was commercially viable to participate in those activities at this time. There is um, uh, a term called uh, fuel leasing, which in essence leases the fuel, the uranium, and uh, takes the uranium back once it's used. We thought that that is something to watch in the future because it might give you the competitive advantage to move into the conversion, enrichment and fuel fabrication areas. The benefit of that are jobs and technology transfer. The third is generation of electricity. I think in the characteristics of this market with the predominance of uh, renewables, a large nuclear reactor was not found to be viable or commercially viable in the state. But that does not mean that in answering climate change responses into the future that we oughtn't to think about nuclear as one of those technologies that are to be considered in the future. Now clearly we were focused on South Australia and it doesn't fit the South Australian market, but it may well fit the Australian market as we decide how to meet our immediate and future climate change goals. And the final opportunity was the storage and disposal of waste. We found, uh, and I won't read that, but there are significant opportunities for the future that um, these provide significant benefits to the community and that social consent, engaging with the community to explain the proposal and the risks and how you mitigate against the risk was critical in the next step. So the Commission recommended a purpose-built facility be considered that we remove the legislative constraints and prohibitions. Now the first concern and this gives you an idea of the sorts of infrastructure that we were considering. A purpose-built ship, port, road transport, interim storage facility, which gives you the opportunity to store waste and aggregate the funds that you need to build the deep geological storage, a railway line, and then the underground storage. But the principal issue in all of this is to understand safety. Safety is always the first issue to be considered. And what I want to show here is to get an idea of the radiotoxicity of waste 
when it comes out of the reactor. And this, for those who can't see it, I think is uh, on page um, 82 of the report. So what this is showing is that as it comes out of the reactor, it has a um, fission products and heavy products, plutonium, americium, iodine. What normally happens to the fuel is it's put in uh, a pool for 10 years to cool, and then it's stored in the open for about 40 years. So 50 years into the cycle, it's lost the best part of 20, to, sorry, to 75% of its radiotoxicity. As we go to 100 years, you can see, to 500 to 1,000 years, we're getting down to a very small amount of the heavy byproducts because all of the fission products have decayed and we are now talking about trace elements left important trace elements which are <coughs> highly toxic and need to be managed but we are in those times at a thousand years we're talking about a very small trace element of what's left of the fuel. This is important because the system that's being used overseas contains really three approaches to contain the fuel in canisters what we can see here so a canister at 400 meters covered with bentonite clay which presents moisture getting into the canister to corrode it and also prevents that when the canister breaks up um, it retards any of the radionuclides that are left from getting out into the environment and you can see that from a hundred, sorry, a thousand to ten thousand years, there are very small trace elements left in the fuel. And if you go to the finish example, which is this one here, it's encompassed in, uh, encapsulated, I should say, in five centimetres of copper. They're testing their canisters to ten thousand years. 10,000 years before the canister breaks down. 10,000 years before the radionuclides that are left move out into the environment. And the heavy metals that are left are generally plutonium and americium. I know this is a lot of detail, but they are the elements that really don't move very far. They stick to the bentonite clay, and really that leaves the iodine left, which is the substance that we're most concerned with. And you've got about 400 metres before uh, we hit the surface. At the surface, what we've seen in the independent agencies in Europe is the, the maximum of allowable radioactivity on the surface is 0.1 of a millisievert. A millisievert is the measure on our daily and our yearly uh, life, we have generally 1.7 to 2.6 millisieverts every day. So this, this is a very small fraction in addition to the background radiation that we have. Now, you would say to me, well, 10,000 years is a long time. How do we make sure that that actually occurs? Well, there's a combination. They have uh, laboratories, underground laboratories, they've had for 30 to 40 years where they test uh, these canisters. They test how they uh, decompose. They test how the radionuclides move in the geology. They run worst case examples of uh, geological movement here. 40 canisters drilling directly into the canisters. So all of this is modelled by an independent agency which approves, this is in Europe, which approves the final uh, plan to dispose of their waste. You'll find in the, um, this report, uh, following our discussions with the um, tentative findings, there's a lot more detail now about this approach and how they test 
to ensure that their expectations of how this material react um, is actually proven. I talked about um, the benefits, so if you assure yourself that it is safe to do this, these, on the modelling that was done for us, these are the sorts of benefits that accrue. Green is obviously revenue, um, yellow is cost. This um, program indicates that we start after 10 years to start to, to take out spent fuel, our used fuel, at the interim storage site. The interim storage site gives you the ability to store the waste as you build your deep geological storage. As the deep geological storage is complete, then the waste is transferred to the interim facility, to the final facility. They are the sorts of numbers that have come out of the modelling. This section at the back is when you close the facility. Uh, that's also covered in the cost base. It's about $32 billion. It enables you to close the facility and then monitor it for the thousands of years that it needs to be monitored. What are the next steps? Firstly, to make uh, the Commission report public, and the Premier's done that today, we need to define broadly what uh, proposition we're going to put to the community and to do that an independent agency uh, with an independent board to facilitate that. It's very important that in gaining and seeking to gain social consent there's no spin, there's no advocacy on this, it's a straight description of what's in the report, the safety issues that have been identified, the means that countries uh, are assessing and managing the risk and then that discussion with the community. So there are three, as we see it, three principal tasks to develop that draft concept that goes out to the community. Clearly part of that has to be the sort of generic siting criteria that would be used to invite communities to participate in that. And what I have in mind in that was really following the Canadian system, very similar uh, sort of constitution, uh, legal and political framework to ours, where they talk about having sufficient land, um, not having any resources in the land so that uh, people aren't trying to dig into it and to rupture some of the canisters. Talking about having um, it not on land that is uh, sensitive or a land that uh, isn't uh, conserved for some other purpose. About land that's got the right geology that enables the barrier system that I described to you to operate. They're the sort of generic uh, characteristics that would be used in uh, inviting the community uh, to participate in the next step after social license. The state government would need to work with the federal government because a lot of the rules and regulations are federal rules and regulations so they would need to be discussed with them um, in that process and clearly uh, this is based upon potential client nations with the federal government that discussion needs to be had with the nations uh, to see whether they want to participate in this process and the indications broadly are uh, that they certainly would. But that needs to be tested with social licence. Assuming we get social licence, these are sort of the steps that follow on that. And this is again taken from the Canadian model of a separate waste agency engaging with the community, seeking uh, interested communities, having a discussion with the communities, giving them time to think about it, and eventually getting the communities to volunteer to be part of the process of um, finally siting a disposal facility. Right, I'm happy to take questions. With the way in which the, all the costs are so heavily back-ended, how do you set up a system so that governments don't 
essentially spend all the revenue uh, and then leave the next generation to cover the cost? Yep, that's a good question. What we've recommended is uh, a wealth fund. Now, um, we see these wealth funds throughout, uh, uh, throughout the globe. Um, a proportion, and what we've modelled is a, a proportion going into a wealth fund, staying in a wealth fund for um, 70 or 80 years. There are prescribed means of extracting money from the wealth fund. What we've modelled is half of the wealth that's generated through interest goes to the community and half stays in the fund. And that brings uh, about $440 odd, uh, billion dollars, uh, as a separate wealth fund for the future. How do we gauge social consent? Um, social consent is, is not a point in time. I don't believe is a point in time. It's a continuum because we would need to develop this discussion over probably 10 or 15 years to get to a point where, perhaps 10 years I hope, where we make a decision, yes, we're going to proceed with this. There's no point in having a single election with a single point in time approval. It needs to be maintained throughout the whole time that you're developing this proposal. It's an issue for government to decide how they will consider uh, social consent. Um, there isn't a, a one silver bullet uh, solution to this. It's a question of engaging with the community uh, and seeking those specialist uh, communicators to decide how they'll um, conclude they've got social consent. How difficult do you think it will be establishing that social consent? It's a contentious issue. It is a contentious issue. It is going to be difficult. This hasn't been done in the world because it's complex. There are many steps in it and we need to take the time to explain the steps, to explain the safety concerns, to explain how you mitigate those concerns. So I don't underestimate the challenge in doing this. There's a reason why um, you see such uh, benefits from it, because nobody's done it before. Do I think we can do it? Yes, I do. What I've seen overseas in visiting these sites, which are near completion, is the same sort of technical infrastructure that we have. Uh, but it is a fair question to ask whether the community wants to be part of that. And that's the next phase. Because if they don't, there's no point proceeding. So just to clarify, you're saying it would take up to 10 years for a final approval? I could, I could envisage uh, that's what's uh, been done overseas. Um, I would hope that if there is strong social consent, you might better move faster. But I've seen a lot of these uh, programs in the past where un very ambitious targets have been set and uh, the community's been rushed and they've been rushed to the extent that they've decided not to proceed. This is a long-term proposal and I think we need to spend the time with the community to make sure that they understand what's being proposed. Are you suggesting that a future government could get cold feet on the idea even if the decision was made by you then? I'm suggesting that social consent needs to be maintained over the total length of the planning program. That's why I think bipartisan support is important. And yes, it is possible. You obviously received a lot of feedback from your tenure findings. We did. Um, I have read through every page of your report, but the fundamental um, findings don't seem to be different. So things like the Australia Institute questioning the economic model and that kind of thing, did you disregard that or to what degree did you take that into consideration? No, I, I thought the responses we got back from the tentative findings were excellent. They challenged us and uh, they required us to go back and review the safety issues, uh, to put much more in the report about the safety issues, to address the clean green image, to address transportation and to address the economics. We did more modelling on the economics. At the end of the day, I think we've got a better report because of the tentative findings, but what we have, as explained in the final report with all the evidence, is what you see before you. We did not, um, we did not conclude, uh, particularly the Australia Institute, that their opinion about uh, price or the quantity of potential uh, used fuel uh, was what we saw going overseas or our independent analysis. Does your role in this finish today, or would you have an ongoing Friday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't see 
having an ongoing role in this. Um, the Premier's asked me to deliver the findings, and to talk uh, broadly about it. Um, I think the next step, as I've talked about, is an independent group um, which doesn't attempt to advocate this. What it does is explains the issues associated with this. So um, any role that I have in this moving forward is about the report, not about the next steps. And would you be involved in the independent agency that might get set up? No, no, I've, I've made it clear that I don't think that's appropriate. I think uh, my role as the Commissioner finishes, has finished. It's this report, that's what I was asked to do. Uh, this is a new group to take it forward and uh, making that clear separation I think is important. In was terms of getting social consent, do you think there are lessons to be learned from the current federal government process? Yes. What sort of lessons do you think we could take from that? Well, I think if you look at what uh, the report says, um, you need to engage the community uh, rather than uh, landowners. Now, it's also quite different. What we're proposing here is to take waste from overseas and store it in Australia that would benefit Australia and also the globe. What we're talking about in the federal issue is waste that Australians have had the benefit of through medical research, through medical uh, diagnosis, through medical treatment. I think they're different, but if we've learnt one thing from overseas, it's engaging with the community, all of the community that's impacted. Uh, that might be uh, the approach that I think we've seen work from overseas. And do you think it will be a tougher sell given, as you just said, you know, the population hasn't received the benefits from the waste? Well, in which... Waste. In terms of, the, you know, the federal government can argue that, you know, if you want nuclear medicine, we have to deal with the waste. Do we you don't. think it will be tougher to sell to people that someone overseas got some power, so we're yes. taking their waste? How do you get around those issues? Well, I think uh, I, I agree with you. It's a different campaign to explain because we are taking waste from overseas for financial benefit. So the issue for us is a matching of the risk, how you mitigate the risk, and what the financial benefits are. And I think, yes, it's a quite different issue than a conversation around we've had the benefit of this um, and now we need to deal with it. But the benefits are significant and I think the risks and the safety issues that I've seen overseas can be addressed. We've got the technical base to do that. The question, the real question, is not what I think. The real question is, what does the community think? And to do that, we need to spend some time with them explaining the report, explaining how it's managed overseas and what we propose to do here. And we shouldn't try and rush that. They'll take their time to consider it. But at the end of the day, if they don't think it's worthwhile, that's the end of the program. Finland's the only place, I think, that's broken ground on long-term storage. Um, um, no, not exactly. It's in the US. Uh, it's also... But Finland's uh, certainly well advanced. They've built the whole facility. Yeah. So are you confident... Because what's being proposed here is uh, much larger in scale. Yep. But scaling up can be done. Uh, the, the, the technology exists to do that. Uh, yeah. I mean, whether you have 1,000 canisters or 10,000 canisters, the concept's the same. A canister in the ground, perhaps 20 metres for the next canister, Filled with bentonite clay, the canister is uh, is a critical part of containing the radio uh, nucleides, the, the, the waste in there. So uh, the size of it doesn't matter. Uh, the size of it, it improves your economies of scale. Um, but we do have a lot of land, and so we have a lot of land that might be ideal uh, in terms of its. Uh, stability, it's uh, the lack of water resource going through it, all of the sorts of characteristics that uh, a lot of other nations don't have. And that gives us the advantage, or gives us an advantage. And where might be uh, able, where might be a, a place that could actually store this waste long term within the state? Um, well, I, I, I wouldn't uh, be rushing to solutions yet. I think what I've seen from overseas when you do that, you fail. So the first part is to have the conversation with the community about the broad concept. 
to establish some siting criteria, some general siting criteria, release that to the community, and then get the community to say, yes, I'd like to know more about this program. That's what's worked, rather than saying to the community, we think that it's suitable on your land, bring out the characteristics, talk about the opportunities in terms of jobs and benefits, and get the community to put up their hand and say, yeah, we want to learn more about this, and then take a measured process to engage the community, to inform them, till they get to, to a decision. And hopefully, uh, you might have two or three communities who are interested in this. You talked about the need for uh, taking your time to build up the public support, but also there's the need to ensure that other countries don't get the jump on us. So how do we find that balance, and you know, is there a timeline on that? Carefully. No, no, it's a good... It's a good question. It's an observation. The thing I would say is there are, we've got a significant number of competitive advantages here. Um, we've got the right geology. We've got a stable um, economic system. We've got a stable political system. Um, we've got a very good reputation internationally for safety, nuclear safety. Uh, remembering that whatever happens needs to be blessed by the international community as well if we're going to establish this joint site. So there are a lot of characteristics that we have that other nations don't. But yes, there is an element of uh, competition and um, attention between taking our time and, and ensuring that there's progress. Is that also why you're advocating you move as soon as possible on this? I think... What I'm advocating is there's a basis now to have a discussion. Uh, let's have the discussion. Let's uh, not gloss over the risks or the safety issues of it. Let's get it out there and have a discussion. Because there'll be a lot of people who will disagree with this. Let's, let's have that uh, conversation. But there's no point in waiting another year to have it. Get it and have it now. Obviously, a lot of work went into this. How are you feeling now? You've been able to hand over that final report. Much happier. <laughs> Look, this is a team report. This is not a my report. You can see the people around uh, here today. Um, Greg's the chief of staff. I've got Ashok. I've got uh, the council assisting here somewhere as well. You know, we put a lot of effort into this. We think it's an accurate representation. Uh, I'm just keen for it to be out and discussed in the community. And uh, whatever comes of that will come of that. Commissioner, to what extent uh, did your team consider the uh, elevated incidence of leukaemias and cancers uh, among nuclear employees within the fuel cycle in other regions? And uh, what are their implications for your work? Well, there's, uh, you'd have to say the evidence is mixed on that. Uh, there were reports earlier that the incidence of uh, rates amongst nuclear workers was much higher than average. And a later report I saw uh, that that evidence was uh, not accepted. So there, so there are actually many decades of medical literature which show this as a recurring theme. There are elevations well, in no, no. I understand, Dan, that you think there's this connection. What I'm saying to you is uh, in the reports that I've seen from uh, UNSCI, uh, also the World Health Organization, organisations that have been established following Chernobyl and those uh, accidents, that that linkage is not there or is yet to be proven. So the answer, the answer to your question is we've had a group of uh, four radiologists and, and uh, radiological experts review this, review the data that we've used, re review the report. Uh, they're from all over Australia and uh, they're comfortable that this is an accurate reflection of what we know at the moment. What are the most substantial changes between the tentative findings and the final report? Uh, just a lot more detail. So what we've attempted to do in the final report is pick up those concerns that we had in the tentative findings about uh, safety, about transport, about security, and also about the financial analysis. So you see a lot more detail. We've remodelled some of the financial analysis to address some of the questions that were asked. Um, it is a sizable report, but I hope it's easy to read. Uh, but it's a report that is complex because the nature of the subject is complex. 
And on the sovereign wealth front, would, it, would an act of state parliament be robust enough to guarantee that, or do you think perhaps a referendum that puts it into the constitution that would be necessary? Well, they're good questions. Um, what we've seen in other nations is a very robust uh, national framework. Uh, state framework could be just as uh, targeted as that, but it is incredibly important that we protect this for the generations to come who will uh, get the benefits as well as the current generation. And so uh, we need to make sure there are benefits there for them. And also you say it should be state-owned. Well, why state-owned and not? Or, or well, state owned because the nature of what we're doing, we're transferring waste from one country to another country. There are international rules about that. The nation's rules are governed by the federal government, not the state government. So it needs to be a combination of both. All right. Thank you very much.